Chào mừng các bạn, chào mừng đã quay trở lại với kênh học IELTS cùng IELTS Thầy là Huy, để có thể nghe thật tốt trước hết là cần tập phát âm thật chuẩn Một trong những cách luyện hiệu quả nhất chỉ là bắt chước lại cách nói của người bản ngữ Vì vậy hãy cùng đến với bài nghe Listening Test số 11 ngày hôm nay để luyện cách phát âm thật chuẩn nhé Test 4. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. In this section, you will hear an interview with a wildlife specialist called Alison Sharp talking about bears. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the history of the bear. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. And in particular, bears in danger of extinction. She is the author of a recent book on bears, and we welcome her to the studio today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. First of all, can you give us a quick overview of the history of the bear family? Well, the bears we know today actually have as their ancestors bears which have been evolving for some 40 million years. We have fossils of the earliest true bear, and it's important to emphasize this because some creatures are called bears but are not. Such as koalas, for instance. <laughs> yes, exactly. Fossils of the true bear show a small dog-sized animal with characteristics that show a blending of dog and bear traits. So the general belief is that dogs and bears were of the same family? Yes, that's the theory. And then we see the arrival of the early cave bear. We know from cave drawings that Neanderthal man used to worship this bear and at the same time fear it. Understandable, perhaps. Uh, yes, but they need not have worried because the cave bear only ate plants. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the cave bear survived two ice ages but then became extinct. In the second part of the interview, Alison talks more about the situation of bears today. So... How many bears can we find today? And are any of them in danger of extinction? Well, I'll answer your first question first. There are eight species of bear in all, among them the American black bear and the brown bear, from which evolved the newest species of bear, the polar bear. So how old is the polar bear? Oh, he's a relative newcomer, just 20,000 years old. And could you tell us a little about them? Which is the largest bear, for instance? Well, the largest bear existing today is either the polar bear or the brown bear. Right. Don't we know? <laughs> well, it depends which criteria you use. The polar bear is the heaviest. The male weighs up to 1,500 pounds, but his narrow body actually makes him look smaller than the much more robust brown bear. So the brown bear appears the biggest? <laughs> yes. And the smallest? Well, the sun bear is the smallest of the eight species. They only weigh between 60 and 145 pounds. That makes him a comparative junior. <laughs> yes. And then next we have the so-called giant panda. But that's a small bear too, comparatively speaking. And are all bears meat eaters? No, not at all. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And are any of them in danger of extinction? Well, I'll answer your first question first. There are eight species of bear in all, among them the American black bear and the brown bear, from which evolved the newest species of bear, the polar bear. So... How old is the polar bear? Oh, he's a relative newcomer, just 20,000 years old. And 
Could you tell us a little about them? Which is the largest bear, for instance? Well, the largest bear existing today is either the polar bear or the brown bear. Right. Don't we know? <laughs> well, it depends which criteria you use. The polar bear is the heaviest. The male weighs up to 1,500 pounds, but his narrow body actually makes him look smaller than the much more robust brown bear. So the brown bear appears the biggest? Yes. And the smallest? Well, the sun bear is the smallest of the eight species. They only weigh between 60 and 145 pounds. That makes him a comparative junior. <laughs> yes. And then next we have the so-called giant panda. But that's a small bear too, comparatively speaking. And are all bears meat eaters? No, not at all. In fact, the giant panda is almost entirely herbivorous, living on a diet of 30 types of bamboo. Oh, yes, of course. Pandas are famous for that. <laughs> and another interesting bear is the sloth bear, which eats insects, particularly termites. Mm. He can turn his mouth into a tube and suck the insects out of their nests. So, going back to my second question, mm -hmm. are bears really in danger of extinction? Yes, indeed, they are. The sun bear in particular, as they've been hunted almost out of existence. And the habitat of the panda is also being reduced on a daily basis. Can anything be done to reduce the threat to these endangered species? I know, for instance, that it's very hard to breed bears in captivity. Yes. Well, I think that by raising people's awareness generally, we can reduce conflict between humans and animals to stop the slaughter in parts of the world where bears are still hunted, supposedly in self-defense or to protect livestock, but often quite unnecessarily. And we can also encourage governments to preserve the natural environment of the bear, rather than allow the areas where they live to be systematically destroyed in the name of progress. Yes, of course. And in addition to these global efforts, all profits from the sale of my book will go toward the United Nations Bear Protection Program. That's wonderful. And with the news coming up, thank you for your time, Alison, and best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You are going to listen to a radio program on sleep deprivation. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. With us in the studio today are Dr Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation and also give some tips to the sleep deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation and how can it affect our lives? Well, the research into sleep deprivation started in the late 50s and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television and computers, which have enabled humans to work 24-7. Before electricity was invented, People's body clocks were synchronised with the sun's schedule and the average time they spent sleeping was eight to nine hours a night. By 1975, that average was down to seven hours and today one-third of us sleep less than six hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation, which basically means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for 3% of plane crashes 10% of domestic accidents, 
20% of accidents at work and 45% of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep-deprived have weakened immune systems and are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep affects long-term memory and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity, indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Helen, You've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities such as reading or filing can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Thank you, Helen. We'll be back after the break and we'll be answering questions we've received from our listeners. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. 
You will hear a salesman giving information to house owners about an alarm system. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Thank you for inviting me to your residence meeting. My name is Martin Pugh from Safe Cell Alarms. I'm going to explain a little bit about home security and I hope you'll all feel a bit better informed and perhaps that you will even purchase one of the alarms we sell. It is all too easy these days for people to break into our homes. Did you know that 25% of all burglaries are committed by burglars breaking and entering via the back door? Even though it is locked, it is still relatively easy for someone to gain entry. And there are parts of our house that we think are not vulnerable because they look inaccessible. But they're not. So, if you're trying to protect your home, you should make sure the top floor is covered by that protection, not just the ground floor. We believe that the only way to secure your property is by having an alarm fitted. Just having the alarm on the outside can put burglars off, and we also recommend that you warn them about the alarm. To do this, we suggest you stick a sign in the front window of the house so it can be seen clearly. This alone should be enough to dissuade a burglar before they start. Now, our company has a range of alarms on offer, and I brought several along for you to see tonight. But let me just explain a few things about them. First of all, all of our alarms are highly visible. They're colored red, and on the underneath, there is a blue light, which you can see whether they are switched on or not. This acts as a deterrent to burglars who can see it as an active alarm system. Like most systems, our alarms are very sensitive, so you do need to look after them. You may be surprised to hear that a cat can often slink around unnoticed under the infrared beams, but a spider crawling across them will set them off. Also, our system is a little different from some. Most companies offer an option that connects their alarms to the police station. All our alarms have an automatic link to our company office. This means we can deal with a situation promptly and can sort out any alarms that have gone off by mistake. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. OK, let me tell you about the installation of our alarms. Later on, I'll show you some house plans and diagrams of how the alarms operate, but you don't have to worry about them being intrusive, as we normally put them in hallways rather than individual rooms. The diagrams show you how the beams work to cover the whole house in this way. Oh, one small thing while I remember is don't leave your security code in your house. A lot of people keep it in the kitchen or their study, but we suggest you leave it with a neighbor so that if there is a break-in, the burglars can switch the system off. Now, regarding the practical aspects of installation, I know that many of you are out all day, and I'm afraid we don't install the alarms at weekends. But we do offer a service where we can fit the alarm system in the evenings for you. But we do charge a little bit extra for that. Finally, we do offer a range of systems, so I suggest you look at the leaflets on our prices. And please don't be put off from investing in a more sophisticated system to protect your home, as we do allow you to set up a monthly payment if it's too much in one go. Okay, now if you'd like to come forward. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. 
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sally Miller, and I'm here to offer you some advice on legal matters whilst you are studying at this university. Happily, most international students complete their courses without running into any serious legal problems. But if you do find yourself involved in a legal dispute of any kind, ask for help. There are two options. First, contact the student's union or welfare officer. Even if they cannot help you directly, they should be able to advise you where to go for help. The second possibility is to contact the Citizens Advice Bureau in your area. You can find them in the local telephone directory. They will be able to recommend a solicitor if you need one and tell you if there is a local law centre providing free legal advice. They will also be able to tell you whether you can claim legal aid to help pay for any court and legal fees. Let me give you some basic information about the police. The police have the power to stop and search anyone who appears to be behaving in a suspicious manner. If you are arrested for any reason, even if you know it to be a wrong reason, remember a few very important things. 1. Don't be aggressive. 2. Do not try to bribe the police officer. 3. If you are arrested by plain clothes police officers, ask to see some form of identification. 4. Give your true name and address if the officer asks you to. Lying to the police is a criminal offence. 5. Do not sign any statement until you have received advice from a solicitor. There is always a solicitor on duty at every police station. 6. You will be entitled to make one telephone call. If you use this call to telephone a friend, Urge your friend to contact someone from your university or from the student's union and get advice about what you should do next. If you find yourself in trouble with the police, it is very important to get professional advice. Contact any of the following. Your university welfare officer, the student's union at your university, your local citizens advice bureau, a local law centre. If you are found guilty of an offence, it could seriously damage your position as an international student, so be sure to ask for help as early in the process as possible. Remember, obey the local laws. The laws here may not be quite the same as in your own country. Here are a few examples of actions that are illegal here. It is against the law to possess offensive weapons. For example, knives, Guns, chemical sprays used for personal defence, even women are not allowed to carry sprays or other deterrents to protect themselves against possible assault, except for rape alarms, possess or supply hard or soft drugs, disturb the peace. This is called disorderly conduct. This means that you can be arrested for being too noisy or rowdy. A few words about drinking. In this country, it is perfectly acceptable for adults to drink alcohol in moderate amounts. For many people, drinking is an established part of their social life. Going out for a drink is how they relax or spend time with friends. If you go to a party or visit people at home in the evening, your host will probably offer you a drink. Often a lot of university social life can revolve around drinking, especially for undergraduates. Do not be surprised if people arrange to meet in a bar or if events are held in a pub. But you are not obliged to drink alcohol if you do not want to, even if you are in a pub or at a party where everyone else is drinking. You can always ask for a non-alcoholic drink instead. And if you feel uncomfortable going to places that serve alcohol, explain this to your friends. There are lots of other places where you can meet. If you do choose to drink, remember that you should never drive a motor vehicle after drinking alcohol. It is dangerous and the police can impose serious penalties on you. Also, remember that being drunk in public is not acceptable either and the police can arrest you for it. Drugs and alcohol can cause serious problems. Let me repeat that in this country it is illegal to use drugs except under medical supervision. 
But if you do use illegal drugs and you develop a problem, there are organisations you can contact. Contact your student's union or your student counsellor. Anyone over 18 years old can legally buy and consume alcoholic drinks in this country. But if you think you might be drinking too much, Get help and advice from your student counsellor or your doctor. Again, there are special organisations that can help you with drug and alcohol problems. Contact them. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.